So good morning everyone. Welcome to Turbulence again. Uh, this, in this lecture I'm going to um, finish uh, the chapter on large eddy simulations. There is only one problem left to do from the problem set. And then I will begin a new chapter uh, on wall modeling. So this is where uh, we finished the content of the chapter on large eddy simulations last time. Let's do um, one exercise, and let's do exercise number two. A computational model domain in Cartesian coordinates is in consideration for our large eddy simulation has a uniform mesh spacing with delta x equal to four meter, delta y equal to two meter, and delta z equal to one meter. Show that the filter uh, width uh, using the geometrical average is delta equal to 2 meter. Okay, so that's the problem you're going to do. So delta x equal to 4 meter, delta y 2 meter, delta z 1 meter. It really doesn't matter uh, which orientation x, y, and z are, but for the sake of making sense of this, let's assume, suppose it was a boundary layer flow where I had uh, flow along the x direction, y was, uh, y was um, into the page, and suppose z was normal to the surface or the wall. So this could be my uh, grid domain. So I'm telling you the grid spacing in each of the x, y, and z directions. So this is certainly a uniform grid. Which means all of the grid elements have the same dimensions or each cell has the same dimensions. Suppose this was my grid. So here, if I take one of these elements out, let's say I bring this element out, it's going to be a slab. So I bring this out, it's going to be a slab, Look, looking like a slab. With delta x, delta z and delta y. So you just plug this into the formula for the geometric average. The filter length is the cubic root of delta x, delta y, delta z, which is cubic root of 4 times 2 times 1, which is 2 meters. So this is, is a length scale that represents the, the cell. If you want, by and large, the size of this cell is delta equal to 2 meters. Uniform grid. Uh, however, otherwise, and usually in practice, Grids are not uniform. I mean, for most boundary flows, usually grids are more refined near the walls. For example, the closer you get to the wall, the more refined the grids are. 
In these cases, calculation of the filter length depends on where you are. I agree. Because wherever you take that geometric average, it matters where you are. If, if you take the geometric average closer to the wall, you're going to calculate a smaller number. But if you take it away from the wall, you're going to calculate a large number. I mean, for example, compare this element. So that's a very thick slab. to this element, it's a very thin slab. So, so delta here is going to be less than delta here. So it, it, it matters where you are. Okay? So all the more reason to really believe me when I say logical simulations are very sensitive to the choice of the mesh or grid spacing. So uh, it's a form of an incomplete model which uh, it's highly uh, depends very, very sensitively on the choice of the grid and its configuration. Okay. Any questions on this exercise two that we did? So there are many really nice exercises at the end of this chapter and every other chapter. Please challenge yourself, think hard about them, and come see me uh, if you can't uh, figure them out or if you want to show me your solutions. Think with me to go through them. Um, and we will set aside time before your second term test to go through them in the class. Hopefully this time class won't be cancelled by a harsh weather situation. Okay. Any questions about logic simulations? So the next chapter is on wall models. It's a, it's a very historically rich topic. Think about it, most people who worked on turbulence model development and turbulence measurements, uh, most people that developed theories and techniques were studying some form of a flow near wall. I mean, take... Uh, Taylor, Pranto, Deerdorf. Um, most of them were studying flow near a wall. For example, Pranto was looking at airfoils, like blooms and airplanes. So well, the wing is, is a wall. Um, Deerdorf was looking at flow uh, near the atmospheric surface, which is another type of wall, if you will. So most likely, we, are, we have some sort of a surface close to which we are studying the flow. So that's why, historically speaking, wall models are very important. But practically speaking, too, they're very important because most often you do a simulation and there are some surfaces in the simulation. It's a wind turbine, it's a pump, it's a, it's a, it's a building. Uh, wherever it is, there are some surfaces. And surfaces are one of the places that models can go horribly wrong. Uh, and that's why you need to do a good job in simulating flow near surfaces. Which means you have to understand wall models really well and if needs be, develop some. Um, walls impose friction on flow, right? Um, so you want to capture the friction really well. There is heat transfer with the wall, right? Uh, take for example, climate change, right? What's happening to the atmosphere? Well, the atmosphere is warming up by the underlying surface. If, if there could be urban development, there could be deforestation, um, there could be traffic, whatever the reason may be, the, the surface is, is putting energy, thermal energy, into the atmosphere. So you want to capture that. 
if you're in the business of designing wind turbines, then you want to capture flow over the airfoil well and understand and quantify it properly so you can design a fantastic airfoil. Or if you're designing Archimedes screws, again, the flow is going around the blade and it's the friction and the weight that turning it for generating power. Um, if you are doing uh, sediment transport studies in rivers, right? I mean, sedimentation happens at the bottom of the river, which is another sort of wall. So the walls are everywhere. Okay, so that's how important they are. Now let's go deep uh, into understanding why simulating flow near walls is difficult. The near wall region in a turbulent flow adds complexity and computational expense to the task of performing calculations for accurately predicting turbulent flows. Um, given the very steep profiles for most solution variables near the wall, I mean, take kinetic energy, dissipation rate, momentum, temperature, whatever you want. Resolving the near wall regions in the, in the turbulent simulation is very costly. Um, I give you an example. What, what do we mean by solutions being very, profiles being steep? Well, we mean that solution profiles exhibit a very sharp gradient near the wall. I mean, take, for instance, a uh, profile of mean velocity. Uh, so this is the wall surface, and if you plot, it, plot this as a function of distance away from the wall, well, the solution has to start from zero, right? There is no motion at the wall. So it's at zero and it's a very steep gradient and only then far away you gradually become gradient free. Does it make sense? I mean, think about this. There's, there's a huge gradient here at the wall, but the gradient is much less here, which means that if I wanted to, uh, to do a good simulation, uh, I would have to have a very a fine mesh near the wall, which means that maybe far away I can get away with a coarse mesh, but near the wall I need to resolve my mesh. But a very fine mesh is equal to a lot of computational expense, which is trouble. So fine grid and steep and steep profiles. Steep profiles. Which means that this simulation is very costly. It doesn't have to be the momentum, it could be temperature, kinetic energy, it could be anything. So to circumvent this problem, um, alternative approaches must be found to model or approximate the solution behavior near the walls using some form of algebraic models without actually having to resolve the solution profiles in, in detail near the wall. Which means for the same wall, uh, if I develop a nice wall model, I can get away with this. Which means the flow still exhibits a very sharp gradient but this time, I don't need a very uh, fine mesh. So you see, mesh is a little coarser near the wall. Uh, but as a result, so, so coarse uh, grid. But as a result, I need to employ some sort of a wall model to be able to get away from this. So on the first layer, I need to employ a wall model. So in practice, for most practical cases, we usually do this and have a simulation we can run reasonably efficiently. Very seldom you resolve flow near the wall. Maybe in some research aspects you do, but if you're a practical engineer, normally you don't. 
the, the wall function is developed exactly for this purpose. The wall function approach, which was introduced by Laundry and Spalding, among others, applies boundary condition at some distance away from the, from the wall. So now I'm telling you how it works. We'll do lots of examples of development. So that turbulence model equations do not have to be solved close to the wall, between the wall and the location at which the boundary conditions apply. Generally, if the first computational cell adjacent to a wall lies entirely inside the viscous sublayer, then wall functions are not required because you're resolving the flow. But most often, the first computational cell covers part of the buffer layer and, the be and beyond where the, there's a law of the wall. In those cases, wall functions do a very good job. Which means uh, if you have a logarithmic law of the wall, the log law, if your first cell is in the log law, then you can very nicely use wall functions. If you have power law, whatever law there is, you want your fir first cell to be in the law so you can handle it. But you don't want it to be in the buffer layer because buffer layers are not well understood. So, I, so in other words, I'm saying you don't want to be too fine to be in the viscous layer or the buffer layer, and you don't want to be too coarse to be far away from the law of the wall. You just want to be exactly at the law of the wall. So it's one of the most uh, tricky parts of simulations, very often overlooked results in wrong results and gives a lot of headache. So if, if possible, you want to avoid it. Let's talk about point-wise the standard wall function. So the, the most simple wall function you might use uh, is described here. I should show you the picture in a moment, uh, but let, let's underline the paragraph, the important parts. The figure on the next page shows uh, the placement of the first computational cell with respect to wall regions according to the law of the wall. The entire height of the first computational cell is delta y, which is two times the midpoint or mid height of the cell. So let's say y sub p is the, is the mid height of the cell. The standard wall function assumes that yp is located at the log of our region. For well, a standard wall function, the standard wall flows from Karman law, which is the log law. The wall function boundary conditions are applied at this location, i.e. at height or y exactly equal to the mid height of the cell. And remember, the subscript p indicates quantities evaluated at this mid height. So I could talk about mid height itself, yp. I could talk about velocity at point p, or I could talk about kinetic energy at point P. I could talk about dissipation rate at point P. Uh, P. I could talk about all these at that point. And then uh, for high Reynolds number, zero pressure gradient bound layers, the log law equation it was given as the following, which I introduced to you in the previous chapter. But before looking at that equation, let's look at the diagram. So here's the diagram. So remember, now flow is going from left to right, and this is wall uh, on, on this surface. And I'm plotting velocity in the x-axis and distance away from the wall y in the y-axis or vertical axis. So what's going to happen? You see the solution has a sharp gradient near the wall, and then gradually the gradient is lost or reduced. Um, the point P is here. That's at the mid-height of the computational cell. So this whole box is the first computational cell. It's the first layer of your grid. So first computational cell. And delta Y is two times the height of the center of this um, computational cell. The so point P is here. And I can look at uh, velocity anywhere. Let's say at point P, the velocity is this arrow, the magnitude of this arrow. So that's YP. 
and I have specified some regions with dashed line. So you see, most likely you are thinking this is the viscous sublayer. Yes, it is. Buffer sublayer and the log line. Um, if you want to plot the same um, data set or log in the normalized form, instead of u, you have u plus, which is u divided by anybody u plus. So next page, it's right, right below. Uh, friction velocity. Velocity divided by friction velocity gives you the normalized velocity, so u plus. It's right here. <laughs> okay. Y plus. Uh, and now, when you convert n n wall normal distance, wall distance to wall, wall nor uh, normalized distance, then these numbers are not well understood. The viscous sublayer is when y plus is less than 5. And that's the law of the wall where u plus is equal to y plus. The buffer sublayer happened between 5 and 30. And that was the difficult region, hard to understand, very transitional. Um, and then above 30 and up to a couple of thousands, you get the log law. So this was the von Karman equation, if you remember. Right? So what we're saying here is you want this point, P, to be in the log law for wall function to work. So that's good. So here is the log law developed by von Karman. U plus is actually normalized velocity, 1 over von Karman constant, ln of y plus plus constant. And we did talk about uh, u, u, uh, u tau friction velocity being defined as square root of wall shear stress divided by density of the flow fluid. And you use this shear stress to normalize uh, to normalize velocity. The balance of the production rate and dissipation rate at the turbulent kinetic energy near the wall is given by this. And this might seem familiar. Right? So actually, some of you attempted to show this in the exam, first test. But this is how you use it, where you use it. So it's highly practical. It's using wall functions. I don't need to prove this because I did it for you. Uh, a couple of lectures ago. So you know if you if you have the friction velocity, you know the dissipation rate in the log. So okay, so I, I know something about the flow, so I'm not in a bad shape. I know quite a few things. In addition, suppose you use a K epsilon model for turbulence, well, most um, models out there are some sort of a Rand model, including K epsilon. And that the expression for the turbulent viscosity for simple shear flows, it's possible to relate shear stress near the wall to the turbulent kinetic energy. Now, this I also did for you um, in that problem. So I showed you this part, right? How Reynolds stress is related to friction velocity. Now I'm adding an extra piece here. I say, um, this is actually related to turbulent kinetic energy. Okay? Now, be aware, there is no, there is no proof for this part. There is a proof for this part, but this is only understood and accepted using like scaling and unit uh, and considered unit uh, considerations. Okay, which is not a bad justification either because think about it. K is turbulence kinetic energy. It has to do with fluctuations of the momentum in x, y, z directions. By definition, it's one half u squared plus v squared plus w squared. Um, Friction velocity, too, is a some form of a variance, if you like. It's some form of a fluctuation velocity squared. It is somehow a type of a variance. So it is sort of um, 
part of a larger Reynolds stress tensor. This too is component of the Reynolds stress tensor. So it looks like all of these terms are somehow related to the Reynolds stress tensor. Okay? And that's how people have suggested this relationship. There's no proof. It's just this is where I put my hand in my pocket and come up with some new uh, form of closing the Reynolds problem. And as a result, a constant uh, pops out, uh, which is a very well-known constant, C mu. I think it's 0.09 for most models. Scott knows. The standard wall function actually uses these relationships to provide a robust boundary condition under all circumstances at that location, yp. And that's the subject of the next page, which I about. So let's see the, what the process is. Well, it's more like a recipe. You follow a number of steps and you, you get there. So let's see where the process begins. In the first place, a nominal friction velocity is defined. Using the value of turbulent kinetic energy at distance yp. Uh, so the nominal um, turbulent kinetic energy, let's say you have a nominal turbulent kinetic energy Kp, you define a nominal friction velocity. What is nominal in English or engineering? I mean, when, when do you say something is nominal? It's a representative, right? It's not exactly what you might get, but it's in the neighborhood, right? So that's nominal, right? So for machining, it says, okay, by and large, the mid-range of a piece, okay? So that's why we call it nominal, because remember, we don't know what friction velocity is. It's one of the hardest things to, to model and measure. It's a, it's a theoretical concept. It's not easy to measure, a little bit easier to model, but all I'm saying is, if you want to first guess for the friction velocity, say the nominal friction velocity, take the kinetic energy you have at point P and use the relationship. So that's the first guess. Of course, you have a kinetic energy uh, in, in your calculation because most likely you have a, a K epsilon model or a K omega model. There's some sort of K available in your model. Even if it's about larger simulations, you have a subgrid kinetic energy, KSGS. So most turbulence models, if they're good, <laughs> they have this. Um, of course, there are algebraic models, mixed and linked models, where you don't have K, but there are other wall functions you can use. Okay, but anyway, we are talking about K epsilon model. Okay, so we have a first guess of friction relations. What's the next step? Next step is to define the nominal y plus, or y star, if you will. So if you remember from last lectures, in turbulent simulations, an exact value of y plus is not known precisely because we don't exactly know the friction velocity. Remember y plus needs a friction velocity for its calculation. But as I said, it's hard to know the exact friction velocity. So you don't have an exact y plus either. But you can also calculate the nominal y plus by using the nominal friction velocity from the last step. So the nominal friction velocity was u star tau. You put that in the definition for y plus, and you get um, nominal y plus. I mean, I remove the plus and put a star here. This yp is still the actual height of the center of the computation. Okay, so I'm one step ahead. What's the next step? The nominal mean velocity is then obtained from the log log. Well, if you need mean velocity, use the log log. That's the starting assumption, which can approximate the true velocity in the vicinity of point yp. 
right? Why not? I, I have I have a nominal y plus, I have a nominal friction velocity, I just plug in the log law and I get the nominal momentum. And here you see why that point has to be in the log law, because if it's not in the log law, you either over or underestimate velocity or nominal velocity. So again, the, the point P must be in the log law. The boundary condition at y p, next step, the boundary condition at y p for the momentum equation is not applied by specifying uh, momentum. So that's, that's what you need to understand. When wall functions are used, you don't apply boundary condition for momentum. You apply a boundary condition for the shear stress. And the way you do it, you do it in a, in a form of an iterative way. So you have, you just estimated nominal velocity, you had nominal friction velocity, and the model had calculated some sort of momentum at that point. Put that in, iterate once, you get an estimate for the Reynolds stress, okay? And you repeat every time the model iterates, it calculates, it tries to get this uh, shear stress better. If, if it only iterates once, you have, uh, you're off. But within usually 10, 15 iterations, you are very close. Uh, 10, 15 iterations are very few for, uh, for most turbulence models. Most of them iterate in the thousands or millions, right? So very quickly you get there. The boundary condition for epsilon, likewise, can be found using the relationship uh, we found earlier. So again, we don't know what friction velocity is, but we use the nominal. And every time we iterate, we get a better and better estimate of friction velocity. So within 10, 15 iterations, you know what epsilon also is. Okay? In fact, if you look into sort of the source code for open foam, go and look at the, uh, the wall function. You, you see the, the loop that iterates over this. In fluent, you can't because it's proprietary. But it must be something close. So while zero normal gradient conditions are applied to K and to the normal stresses, well, for K, a normal stress, that's fine. You have K, you're solving for K, but it's just the shear stress that needs to be handled this way. In finite volume simulations, the location of YP is taken to be the, the, the first grid node away from the wall. Um, like open foam, fluent, star city, most of them are finite volume solvers. Wall functions in general introduce YP as an artificial parameter. For boundary layer flows for which the log law relations are accurate, the overall solution is sensitive to the choice of YP as long as it's within the log law region. It doesn't matter if it's 30, 40, 50, 200, sometimes 1,000, 2,000. It doesn't matter where it is. The answer is pretty good. It's only when you go above a couple of thousand that this problem will start to arise. However, in other flows, uh, it is found that the overall solution is sensitive to this choice because maybe the log law to begin with was not a good assumption. I mean, for most Newtonian fluids, the high Reynolds number, it, it is a good assumption. It gets into a problem where uh, flow becomes non-Newtonian, where Reynolds numbers go down, flow is transitional, and when surfaces are highly heterogeneous, they're not by and large flat, they have a very uh, unique roughness structures. I mean, the blade of a wind turbine or an argument screw or the facade of a building by and large is flat. But you can get more complicated surfaces, in which case the, the wall function based on a log law may struggle. As a result, it may not be possible to obtain a numerically accurate and grid independent solution. So, uh, as a, so why it seems very simple, and it, it really is, 
it can go wrong very easily. <laughs> so that's the message. So be careful. So now you know um, the standard wall function, and you know how it works. I mean, if you have a k epsilon, k omega, or larger, sim larger simulation with a k equation in it, go there and do it. And you can design the wall function and uh, work with it. In fact, we have a com computer assignment where you make a wall function and make it work, which is very nice. Well, what about other wall functions? I mean, we said already the the wall function needs a knowledge of kinetic energy. What if you don't have one? What if you have a algebraic model, a mixed index model? What else would you, can you do? Well, there's lots and lots of wall functions out there. And here I'll, I'll give you another example, a very popular the integra integrated Werner Wenger wall function. So let's begin with some of the limitations of the standard wall function and then tie this into the new wall function. So it was seen in the standard wall function that one needs to solve and resolve the turbulent kinetic energy near the wall, at least at point yp, so that one can estimate the friction velocity by the nominal friction velocity. For the wall function to provide the shear stress boundary condition at point yp in this way, one requires an iterative approach that could impose some computational cost. I mean, I said it's only 10, 15 iterations, but some people don't want to have 10, 15 extra iterations. After all, numbers could add up, right? Every time you iterate, you have 15 more iterations to do. So it can be avoided by using some more sophisticated wall functions. Alternatively, a wall function was proposed by Werner and Wenger back in the 90s that eliminated the need for the solution of the turbulent kinetic energy. And in fact, it provided a closed form solution for the shear stress near the wall, given other known parameters. In addition, this was this wall function integrated the entire profile of U plus over the first computational cell in a direction normal to the wall to arrive at a better estimate of U plus compared to pointwise models. So think about what we we did before. We just looked at y, location y p. But in this new uh, function, I claim that I want to integrate the u plus, integrate u plus, so I can hopefully arrive at a better estimate of u plus. Okay. Let's now uh, do the mathematical details. The Werner Wenger wall, wall function provides a, a piecewise relationship between u plus, u plus and y plus. So, in the viscous sublayer, it's assumed the same as the standard law of the wall, meaning that u plus is equal to y plus. Okay? And then that's valid until 11.81. It's valid up to, a, up to and beyond 5, right? Remember, the viscous layer ended at y plus equal to 5, and then the buffer layer started. But here I'm making a simplification. I assume the buffer layer is non-existent. And right after the viscous layer ends, the law of the wall begins for larger values of y plus. And the law of the wall is not logarithmic, it's power. It's power law. Uh, and there are some constants. Like A is 8.3 and B is 1 over 7. Now, how can a power law and logarithmic law be good approximations? I need to put a picture here. So remember, when we talk about logarith uh, the log law, let's say x, y. The log of x is something like that. Okay, so this is the natural logarithm of x. The power law also 
may show a similar behavior. I mean, it might really actually, believe me. Let's say this could be something like x to the 1 over 7. So even though one is a, a logarithm and the other one is a power, but they exhibit the same shape. You know, they go up quite fast at the beginning, but then they plateau to the right. So that's why, for, uh, for most purposes, the log law and power law are both good approximates. Okay, now the other thing is, let's take a, take a little bit of detailed look, look at the at this specific wall function we use. So now I want to plot, plot y plus versus u plus. I just want to show you uh, the, the, the law of the wall. So we said well, u plus is equal to y plus all the way up to 11.81. Remember? So in this region, u plus is equal to y plus. But then I say after this, immediately the, the law of the wall becomes the power law. So then you get the rest of this. Okay? So u plus is equal to a y plus. I mean, uh, in terms of shape, it's has the same shape to the standard uh, law of the ball, the law of the ball. Now, so let's go back to the equations. Uh, in fact, the two, um, the two laws, the linear and the power law, intersect at some specific value, y plus 11.1, and it's not always 11.81. It's not always 11.81. Actually, this intersection depends on the choice of A and B. And some power laws are 1 sixth law, 1 eighth law, or this A is not 8.3, then it's 8.2, then it's 8.1. So there's some, you can fit different values. You, you could do um, an exercise in the problem set to show that actually the intersecting uh, y plus is a function of a and b in this way. So you, you can do this, and you're asked to do it in the problem set. Basically, you equate this to that, and you solve for y plus. It's not very hard to do. Now, let's now do the rest of this the wall function development. It is possible to find an average value for u plus over the entire computation of cell in the wall normal direction. Remember, uh, we want to we want to come up with a better estimate of u plus. Just uh, picking point p in the middle of the first cell is not good enough. You can actually average u plus in this wall function method. So to do that, you take this integral. So you Basically, you integrate u plus from the bottom of that cell to the top of that cell. And you divide by the height of that cell. So this is a very different, very, the very definition of taking an average, right, in the continuous domain. Remember, when I say uh, u plus, I mean uh, uh, a u plus as a function of, right? Because u plus always has a functional form, right? It could be linear or power law. It has a functional form. So when I say integrate u plus, I'm saying to you integrate that function. So this bracket is just the function of. It's not that I'm multiplying u plus by y plus. I'm just saying u plus is a function of y plus. Clear to everyone? No. But this function changes in the linear region u plus is y plus, so from 0 to y plus i, the intersecting point, u plus is y plus, so that's that. But from y plus above, I'm in the power law. So you, to take this integral, you need to break it into two parts. Uh, for, the, for the first law and the second law. I sound like thermodynamics, but I'm not talking about thermodynamics. I'm saying linear law and the power law. 
Okay? So now I have a specific function of forms and I can integrate. So note that I define this integral over y plus. I mean, I could have done it over y. But there's no reason why you can't take an integral over y plus. Be my guest. So don't, so don't be confused of the, the pluses. It's just taking the integral in, in the normalized form. That's definitely permissible. Okay? So as a result, your um, uh, dy, the, the, the integrand, becomes a plus. And the differential in there is also a dy plus. Like so, makes, makes sense? Okay. So now I can take this integral, and if I do this, I'm actually finding the average u plus. Uh, u plus. So where the integral is split into two integrals appropriate for each wall of each end. This definite integral can be evaluated such that um, you get this. I mean, with first year calculus, you can take that integral, and this is what it would be. In fact, I gave this as a PhD qualifying uh, problem to one of the grad students and they excel at it. So it's so, or you might see some something like that in, in an exam or something. So it's just a bit of a proficiency in first year calculus, which is required really to understand this course. And some differential equations. So which by substitution I can find the average velocity. So remember, u plus already contained uh, the information about um, average. But the really surprising fact is that once I go uh, out of the normalized domain uh, to express the actual variable, not normalized, but the actual velocity, somehow, mysteriously, some of these friction velocities cancel. So at the end, even though friction velocity was part of the um, was part of the equations, mysteriously it, it vanished, which is a very nice property of this equation. So I believe Werner Wenger used power law in the first place, so friction velocity would cancel. You see what I'm saying? So they pulled the mathematical trick to eliminate the inconvenient to eliminate the inconvenient terms. It's hard to measure a model. So this angle U is the, is the mean velocity averaged over the control volume. So don't confuse the angle bracket and average here. Angle bracket comes from ensemble averaging, right? Remember that, statistical mean. But this average is coming from averaging this over all of the control volume over all of the first computational set. So represents the control volume average mean velocity, not to be confused with angle bracket P. Uh, this meant ensemble average only at point P, not over the entire control volume. So there is a definite, definitely a distinction. So up represents the mean velocity only at point p in the standard wall function. Finally, this whole um, equation can be arranged to give the square of friction velocity as an explicit function of other known variables and without the need for turbulent kinetic energy k. So if you if you further rearrange this, and this was also part of the qualifying exam for one of the excellent students, they finally arrived here, which 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 can be like this the shear stress averaged over the entire control volume can be very nicely described using all other convenient parameters. There is no k here, 
there's no epsilon here, there's no friction velocity here. Everything is what I have. I mean, most turbulence models should give you some velocity. Right? So whatever the model is, it must have the power to predict velocity at, at the minimum. So that's there. Viscosity is a material property, and this is just a function of um, distance away from the surface at, to the mid height of the control volume. So really, this means I can use this wall function with any turbulence model. Whatever turbulence model is out there, I can use this wall function. Because the, as I said, the dependency to, uh, on uh, kinetic energy, dissipation rate, friction velocity was all removed. I mean, really, you have to look at this for five minutes to appreciate the value of this development. Uh, it's a very popular wall function. In fact, there is also a uh, other variants of this for like a thermal boundary layer. There's another equivalent wearing wrangle for thermal, where this is the heat flux, heat flux, right, and, and, and the rest. So you see, we did something more or less similar here. We expressed, uh, we expressed. Uh, sh shear stress at point P is a function of some other parameters which were not very convenient. I mean, I needed to have some estimates of K um, and, and epsilon to get to here, right? But alternatively, the Werner uh, Wrangel model gives you an estimate of shear stress not at point P, but averaged over the control volume based on a, a lot of nice properties. So note that in control volume schemes for computational dynamics, um, most solution variables are in fact averaged throughout each control volume when you run a fluent or open volume simulation. You are looking at the average solution over the entire control volume. So all the more reason to use the Wengel model for the walls because it's consistent with the notion of control volume uh, analysis. So this is consistent with control volume. A lot of your labs, computer labs, are finite difference. I think all of them are finite difference for the simplicity of uh, teaching. Uh, but this very well works uh, with finite difference too. And in fact, the, the wall model you de de deploy for the computer assignment is the first one. Uh, is this one, which is that should definitely work for finite differences because in finite differences you look at solution at a point. You don't do any averaging over control volume. So you only do this in the two assignments. And that's good enough, I think, for understanding how all functions work. Okay. Let's talk about some of the implications on using wall functions for large energy simulations. Well, this will definitely work with any Rand's model, K epsilon, K omega, KL, um, or even algebraic model with no K. What are the implications of using wall functions for large edge simulations? So let's uh, talk, talk to you about that. So this is called Van Driest near wall treatment. If you remember, in large edge simulation, based on Smogorinsky closure scheme, the Smogorinsky length scale was introduced as LS equal to some constant Cs times the filter with delta. And Cs is a constant, and delta is the filter length, typically chosen as the geometric average of the local grid sum. However, there's a problem here. Near walls, the actual length scale can reduce significantly than provided by the Smogorinsky length scale formula. This reduction is not taken into account. The ex then, artificially, excessive dissipation of thermal kinetic energy is accounted for. Here. I will put some nice pictures. Please. Remember, uh, 
the physics of flow near a wall um, implies you have very small eddies near the wall. Right? If this was turbulent flow over the wall, you agree with me that the scales of turbulence near the wall are much smaller, which means that there must be a much smaller mixing length near the wall. So if that's the wall, these are eddies. <clears throat> okay? Now, on one hand, I know this from the physics of the flow, boundary flow, but on the other hand, if I if I bluntly threw a mesh here, which was uniform in, in spacing, I neglected the fact that the mesh must be resolved near the wall, then the, the Smogorinsky model is going to assume the same mixing length for all of these. Right? Because mixing length from the point of view of large eddy simulation is just calculated with the local grid um, filter or delta. But, but in reality, this is, what I, this is what I need. Even if I kept the grid constant, sure, I would have large mixing length far away from the wall, but then mixing length must be actually forced to be smaller near the wall. So this is what I need. This is what I don't need, or don't need. Okay? So, if you don't use what you need, if you use this one, you are going to artificially over dissipate kinetic energy because large dissipation means, means over dissipation of kinetic energy and your model will be wrong, okay? So Van Dries came up with a simple solution, uh, correction to this, so he said, why not damp the mixing length near the wall using some sort of exponential function? And it's, it's, it's a very practical solution. And he said, let's uh, throw in a couple of more constants, right? And then this is what uh, he provided. He said, look, just, just give me y plus. Uh, instead of using this, discount ls by an exponential function and force it to go to 0 eventually near the wall. So this somehow takes care of the over dissipation problem. This was one of the very unique and interesting contributions like over 50 years ago, which we still use today. Isn't this it's amazing? Uh, so he understood that this would be such a utility for future computations. Um, yeah, really, that you may think it, we are done in wall functions. Yeah, I mean, for the purpose of this course we are, but not in our careers and research projects because they, these wall functions, wall models always come up and you have to think about them very carefully for your model to work. So to summarize this, Wall functions are used widely to economize uh, turbulent simulations. However, they can be much more complex than introduced here. You could have, let's say, thermal wall functions, uh, species transport wall functions. Uh, even turbulent kinetic energies themselves have wall functions. The solids are wall functions. For instance, um, you, you might actually have a, not, not a two-layer, but multi-layer wall functions. Uh, with a lot of complications, and a good reference is the Temerman in 2003, which discusses a lot of these. Again, it doesn't say that to do a good job, you necessarily need a complicated wall function. Sometimes you need simple wall functions, but you have to know what you're doing. Okay? So really nice. And there's, there's lots of nice problems in this, uh, at the end of this chapter, which you can try. Some of them have appeared in the previous exam. Really nice. It helped settle the material in. So any questions before I do an ex exercise from, from this?
Any questions from online? You can leave a comment or shout out. Okay. Let's do a really nice problem. Problem seven. Now, this problem uh, comes directly out of my research. Actually, I struggled with this problem um, for my research. I was developing a, a method for inserting uh, inlet fluctuations for a large edge simulation, so it was quite a bit of a struggle. So I had to derive an expression. Uh, and I, I, I did it, I was amused. I said, why not put it in the problem set for students to enjoy as well. Um, here's the problem, number seven. We said alternative to logarithmic wall model, you can also use a power law wall model. Uh, especially for applications in atmospheric bound layers or oceanography and things like that. So Seinfeld and Pan just provide an example that, uh, let's say, above uh, the, the velocity, uh, ensemble mean velocity at some height above the, above the wall or the Earth's surface, the atmosphere, is Velocity at some reference point, most often this is taken at 10 meter above surface, times power, a power law. So you take any height, divide by the reference height, 10 meter, raise it to the power alpha. So Z ref is some reference height, and U at Z, Z ref is some reference velocity, most often wind speed for atmospheric application. And then alpha is the power uh, exponent, which needs to be fitted. The idea is to express alpha as a function of z ref, uh, reference height, and some other number z naught, also known as the aerodynamics roughness rate. If the logarithmic and power law wall things are to be matched at a reference height z ref, Okay, so the, the problem is asking me to derive an expression for alpha, assuming I match the power and logarithmic law at, at z ref, and then uh, the problem gives you some steps to follow to do this. So follow these steps. First, we arrange the power law, uh, the power law wall model to express alpha as the following. Well, not as the following, but where is it? Oh, same page. So, yeah, as the following. So, first, rearrange uh, the logarithmic and power law to, to be able to express alpha in this way. Okay, so this, this is somehow representing alpha as a function of z ref, but there's no information of z naught. So, the question is, what was z naught? How do I use z naught? So you first, you do that one, then you substitute both of both uh, velocity at z and z ref by a logarithmic wall model. And after doing this, you can um, express alpha as a function of uh, only the heights, including the aerodynamic roughness. And finally, you take the limit of the expression you found to explicitly formulate uh, the exponent as a function of reference height and uh, aerodynamic roughness state. This is such a practical and useful expression to arrive. And I'm going to show, show how to do it. And the way to get there from the limit to here is another wonderful calculus rule called the Hopital rule. Uh, any, any of you remember that rule? Maybe high school or first calculus? It's an extremely powerful rule. So you actually use that to show this expression. But anyway, 
Let's do this project slowly, and I show you all the all of my fascination with the project, and all the uh, assumptions and tricks and so on. So remember, um, so that's exercise seven. Exercise seven. Uh, you as a function of pi, given the power law, is is. Which means that if you plot it, now this time I want to put u here on the horizontal axis, and then z, which means that you should get something like this for a power law. And this is uh, z, z ref, or u at z ref. And this is z ref. Well, it looks like a power law. Um, and then I'm asking you uh, to match this with a logarithmic law. Well, maybe the logarithmic law is has the same shape, but is a slightly different, right? I mean, this could be this could be a log law. This could be a power law. Part of the exercise is to intersect the two or overlay the two at this point, okay? Which is z red. One thing about aerodynamic roughness length. So, if you have any sort of rough surfaces. The rough surface can have a, a number of uh, microscale features on the surface. I mean, this could be a, a rough surface, could be an urban area. The actual average height of the roughness elements may be shown by symbol H. Okay? H is known as characteristic roughness length. H is known as characteristic uh, roughness length. Uh, Z0, which is the aerodynamic roughness length, is somehow scales as a fraction of H. This is known as aerodynamic. Roughness length. I mean, it's not always 0.1, it could be 0.2 or 0.03, depending on the type of roughness. I mean, in, in atmospheric science, depending on the land cover, you might have trees, you might have buildings, you might have bush or grasslands, asphalt, um, even the density of the forest. All of this determines the relationship, but by and large, there is aerodynamic roughness that is some fraction of the actual roughness height. And every surface in Durban's modeling is characterized by an aerodynamic roughness length, Z0, and that's how important that is. I mean, take weather simulations, for example. There is a Z0 required for a meaningful weather simulation, or whatever flow system you might have near a wall, because it's impossible to get a perfectly smooth wall. Most walls are rough. If you put it under a microscope, any wall is rough. Okay? Now, the first thing we do is we uh, intersect the power law and the log law. And if you intersect that, you can solve for alpha and show alpha is log of uz, uz ref, and the log of Z over Z red. Okay. The next thing comes from the very definition of power law, and then you do the matching. So match. U Z 
said, using the, the relationship for log log, What was u tau? What was u tau? Friction, velocity. What was kappa? Yeah, yes, on carbon constant. The idea is to, anytime I see, I see u in this uh, expression, I replace it with the log log. And this is what I'll get. So on top, I get u tau kappa bond. Is that what is it now? Bottom u tau kappa long of z over z ref or is it not all in a large bracket on the bottom? I don't do anything because I only have long of z. So this is the expression I was asked to arrive, and now it's time to get to um, simplify this and using the Opital's rule. So first of all, I mean, a lot of the stuff cancels here, like all the friction velocities uh, for common constants cancel from the top and bottom. So I will only get ln of ln of z or z naught minus ln, ln of z ref, or is it not? And then ln of z over z ref. It, it goes without saying, it's the property of ln, so ln of a over b is equal to ln a minus ln b. So I actually use that property to simplify that a little bit further and get rid of the fraction on the top. Now is the next step. <coughs> what happens if alpha, if if Z approaches Z ref? Well, that's when you take the limit. If I approach Z to Z ref, then I get a zero by the division of zero by zero in here, um, which permits me to use the Hopital's rule. And in fact, it, it, it necessitates, necessitates me doing this, right? Because I'm not allowed to have fractions zero divided by zero. So then I use Hopital's rule. Which permits, to, permits me to evaluate this limit. Remember, if you take a limit of two functions, f of x over g of x, as x approaches some zero, this is also equal to the limit of f prime of x over g prime of x. That's the definition of the Opital's rule. Uh, but both f and g uh, must approach. Zero or infinity, they must be differentiable and continuous. Continuous. I mean, these are the requirements for you to use 
the, the orbitals rule. So if you apply the orbitals rule, then the, the limit uh, above is going to be this. First of all, there is no z here, so taking the derivative of this part is zero, right? There's no z here. So it's only this, there's a z here, and there's a z here. So I only need to differentiate the top, that term, and the bottom this term, and divide one by the other. And if I did that, alpha would be 1 over z ln of z over z naught that uh, cancels and I would only get ln of z ref over z naught. This is what I was asked to to derive. I mean a couple of a couple of notes. I mean let's let's show you how to take a ln. I mean this came up in the exam too. I mean let's say if you want to take the partial derivative of d over dz of ln of z over z naught. So this is where you use the chain rule. Uh, if you remember, chain rule will give you 1 over z naught over z over z naught. It's still equal to 1 over z. So there's a couple of chain rules involved here. I mean, here you have a more complicated chain rule. Uh, so you apply all of that, and then you arrive at uh, this expression. So at the end, you just highlight. It's a very important practical um, uh, result. A lot of CFD engineers use this. They can act, they actually fit uh, alpha given uh, the reference height and the aerodynamic reference length. It's very practical and we use it in our research all the time too. Okay, so it's a bit of a, a bit of work, calculus work to see where things uh, come about. Okay, so that concludes the chapter on wall, wall, wall models. There's only really one substantial chapter left. In my opinion, it's not even substantial because it's just model evaluation, error calculation, and things like that. We can get that done in less than a lecture. So really, by, hopefully by the end of the next, le the next lecture, we'll finish all the material. Sounds good. The presentation seminars are posted. If you have a scheduled conflict, come see me. We move you around. Otherwise, please pick a nice paper for a presentation. Uh, there are some guidelines provided in the note. It has to be recent or a classic, and it must be related to the topic of the course. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions? See you next time.